I, I think I've told you this. I think I told you this maybe last year. Um, but, I, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I told my wife. When we got that call from, from, from not from John, from High, uh, and we talk about grudging submissions, I, you know, it's like 11.30 at night. You don't want to get up and go to the airport. But I, I, but I told my wife, I told my wife, I want to treat John like Linda Road treats us. And so if he felt loved, it's because it boomeranged to him from y'all. So, uh, and, and I thought about y'all being here and, and trying to love him and things like that. But, um, but, you know, it's miserable when you're trying to go somewhere and he talked about saving up money and trying to get ready for that and it, it doesn't happen. So, anyway, it's a neat, neat opportunity. Okay, if you have your, your Bibles, um, we're going to be in, in Hebrews chapter 3, but we're actually going to start in John chapter 9. So, if you want to get to John chapter 9 and verse 28, we'll be there in just a moment. You know, I feel like someone ought to ring the bell for us. Ding, 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 you know. In, in this corner, we have Moses. In this corner, we have uh, Jesus. But this is an interesting topic. It, it, to me, it was one of the more difficult ones because of not being a Jew and, and having to try to wrap my mind around Moses and the importance to the Jews. And, and like in the previous class, if you were in there, that we talked about trying to understand and not be so critical of the Jews until we understand their, their mindset. Um, personal preferences are cr crazy things. The intensity of people's personal preferences. We're living out in West Texas. And about 6 o'clock one morning, Heather gets a knock on the door. And there's a man there. And he said, we were down at Dairy Queen this morning. And we were talking. And we've decided that Kevin needs a pickup truck. <laughs> yeah. We have decided that this is what you need. We have decided this is what's good for you. And, and it, it's not just West Texas, but anywhere. We have very strong preferences we like things a certain way. We like things to be a, a certain way. And, and those preferences can be intense. For example, for, for basketball fans, Michael Jordan versus LeBron, LeBron James. Who, who's the better player? And you say, well, I'm not a basketball player. I want to tell you something about where this picture is from. This, I didn't have to put these two pictures together. The, this picture is from an article about a man charged with assault. But over this question, he beat his friend because they were talking about this. It's just basketball. <laughs> Them's fighting words. You know, for, for, for some people, it, personal preferences become such an intense thing, even over a sport, even over something like that. And you might say, well, I, I don't care. I don't even know who those individuals are. This, this whole cell phone thing, you know, the, the Android versus Apple and and. and, and well, you're an Apple fanboy, and oh, you're just to this. And you see there's, there's actual friction, and people will fight about it, and they'll argue about it, and they'll spend time arguing about my preference is better than your preference, and, and it's just a phone. Hmm? Say, well, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> now you've got an opinion. Now you've got a preference. And there are people with, well, I'm a cat person, and I'm a dog person, and, and you've got a preference. And if you're a dog, well, you've probably got a breed preference of a certain type of dog, and a big dog, or a little dog, or an outdoor dog, or an indoor dog. And, and you could keep going with, with all of these preferences that we have. And they're little. They're over little nitpicky things, but people come to blows over them. People get angry about them. People will stop talking to their friends because their friends don't like what they like. Now, I, I want you to take that a step farther and we start talking about more serious things. Sometimes we develop preferences for people. For example, they, there's some, you know, they call it preacheritis. Right? Did you know this? In a congregation, statistically, in a congregation when a preacher leaves and goes somewhere else, on average, 15% of the congregation leaves as well. 15%. Now, you, you think about that. You think about that. So, oh, yes, we're a family. We're the family of God. Well, actually, I was just here for him. More than one out of every 10 members on average. One out of 10. That's a lot of people who say, my preference is for that person. How, how far back in time in the history of the church do you go before you see that kind of preacheritis? 1 Corinthians. Well, I'm a, I'm a Paul. Really, you're a Paul guy? I would have, I would have thought you were more of a, of a Peter guy. <laughs> Paul and Peter guys, I am of Apollos. 
And there's the guy over in the corner going, no, no, I'm, you know. Everybody's got their preference. And, and Paul has to write to them, and it's preserved for us in God's Word, that he has to tell them, is Christ divided? Do you really have to pick and choose among these people? And say, well, I'm glad that I've never been a, a victim of, of preacheritis. Do you know how many people you run into that have a parent preference? You'll be in the middle of a Bible study and you're opening God's Word and they're listening and they're learning and they're very excited about what they've learned until that light bulb goes on and they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that my dad or my mom is not saved? And, and the study ends and they don't want to hear another word. Or something their grandfather told them. And it must be true because grandpa told me it was true. And so we have this preference. And if it's someone important and someone that we revere, someone that we respect, then that becomes law. And we can't imagine that person doing anything that wouldn't be in accordance with God's word. You see, sometimes for some people in the church, it becomes an author. Someone who writes a certain book. And they'll say, well, I read it in this book. And, it, and it, it's got to be true. And, and, and this, this author is so great. And, they, and they, would never, they would never lead me astray or say anything that's wrong. And so we get these strong personal preferences. And if someone says, well, I don't really care for that author or that person or that sport or that phone or that animal, we say, well, <laughs> I thought we were friends. And that can be the end of that relationship. We understand the pull of following a person or following a thing. And so when you get into this idea of Moses versus Jesus, you can imagine... You can imagine how intense this would be. Or maybe you can as, as not being a Jew, but I want to look at some verses. I, I want to look in John chapter 9 to begin. Before we look at that comparison, I want you to see the mindset of some of the Jewish people. In John chapter 9 and verse 28, in, in John chapter 9, Jesus has, has healed a blind man. It's an incredible miracle. The man is so excited. And they ask the parents, and the parents don't want to say anything because verse 22 says that they don't want to get put out of the synagogue. They don't want to get thrown out. So they, they say, well, ask him. Go, go ask him. He's of age. He's old enough. And then verse 24, for the second time they called the man who'd been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And the, the formerly blind man said, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind. Now I can see. That's all I know is that I can see now. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now look at verse 28. And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple. But we, what does your Bible say? We are disciples of Moses. Okay? The Son of God is in their midst. The Son of God in the flesh. And they can't stand it. I don't know who that guy is. He's a sinner. He's a blasphemer. He's doing things by the devil. Anything they could come up with. But we know one thing. He's no Moses. That's what we know. That man is no Moses. And you can imagine that on a level. Well, I don't know about LeBron James. He's no Michael Jordan. You know, that, it's that, but, but, on, but on a much greater scale. This, and if we can come to blows over basketball and phones and animals, imagine when it comes to religion. You know, they always say there are two things you can't talk about, religion and politics. You know what everybody wants to talk about? Religion and politics. People feel intense about these things. They have strong feelings about these things. So I want to ask you this, and you have to shift your thinking away from a 21st century American and try to think more like a, maybe a 1st century Jew. Why would Moses be more appealing than Jesus? If you had a choice between the two, I mean, Jesus was, uh, you, to be around him, you had to have seen his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his wisdom when people heard him, even his enemies. You know, men were sent to arrest Jesus, and they came back empty-handed. They said, why didn't you arrest him? <laughs> No one ever spoke like that before. He speaks with authority, not like these guys. He, they were amazed. Why didn't these people see Jesus and say, wow, he's so much better than Moses? Think about some of the comparisons they made. Who was the friend of God? Moses, yeah. They knew their, they knew their Old Testament history. They knew those things. Moses spoke to God face to face as good friends do. He's a friend of God. But what about Jesus? Who did he hang out with? Oh, he hung out with the sinners. He, this, this man, Jesus, 
You know who he hangs out with? Our Moses hung out with God. Jesus hangs out with prostitutes. Jesus hangs out with, with drunkards and tax collectors, those traitors that, that, that betray their own countrymen. If, if you have to choose between a friend of God and a friend of sinners, and if you're a religious and righteous person, who are you going to choose? You're going to choose the person who hung out with God. Mouthpiece of God and mouthpiece of the devil. Oh, Moses, he delivered the law. As we call it the law of Moses. And, and he is our identity. And we're the Jews and, and we're God's people. And, and the law was given through him. This, this other guy, Jesus, I don't know who he's doing this by, but we're pretty sure it's the devil. No? He does these things by, by Beelzebul. They, they accused him of being in league with the devil, in league with Satan. And so when they compared the two of them, here's a man who speaks for God, and here's a man who's a mouthpiece of the devil and the demons. <laughs> who are you going to prefer if you're a religious and a righteous person who sees yourself as holy? He's Moses, he's the leader of our nation. He led our people. He, you know, he, he brought us out of Egypt. He is a, he's kind of a, a father figure in our, in our nation. You're an enemy of the nation. Isn't this the accusation against Jesus? Hey, he's trying to destroy everything that Moses taught us. He's trying to tear down everything Moses built up. Moses was the leader of our nation. This man is the enemy of our nation. If you think like a Jew, there is no reason in the world that you wouldn't prefer Moses. Moses was everything they thought Jesus was not. Why would you follow a friend of sinners who spoke for the devil and was opposed to your nation? when what you really wanted was a friend of God who spoke for God and led your nation. He's revered. I don't know who he is. That's exactly what they told the blind man. I don't know who that guy is. We are disciples of Moses, and they would have felt good about that. How many times in the Bible did they come up to, to Jesus and say, um, Moses taught us this, but what do you say? Now, when Jesus answered those questions, how did they feel about his answers? Did not like his answers. Well, You've heard it said, you could fill in from Moses, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You know, and, and it may have been like this at one point, but, but I'm telling you something is different. So if your hero, if you went up and you had a hero and you said, my hero told me once, and the person said, I'm sorry, your hero was wrong. How are they going to react? I'm not, I don't like to hear that. I don't, I don't care what you think. You're wrong. You must be wrong because he's my hero. And Moses was a hero for them. So I, I want you, I was trying to think of an equivalent for us as Americans. And I don't, I don't think we have one. We talked maybe the closest we could get would be whom? Maybe Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, what we call our founding fathers. But even that, I mean, if someone comes up to you and says, well, I, I think George Washington was kind of a jerk. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> maybe he did chop that tree down, you know. You know, but at least he told the truth about it. But we don't revere them for, because I think for us as Christians, our equivalent is Jesus. And when someone tells us Jesus isn't really Jesus, we feel that same kind of... Can you imagine someone being able to come and convince you, look, Jesus was a fraud, he wasn't real. You, you would you burr up under that. I mean, you, you would bristle and, and you would think that's, that's not right. He's Jesus and, and, and he was spoke for God and he was, he was one with God and he's the leader of the church. And you would make some of these same arguments for Jesus. Let go of Moses. You got to let him go. Sounds like, an old, like a bad relationship. <laughs> you got to let him go. He's, he, he's, you know, you can't be into him anymore. It's time for you to move on. It's, it's, it's that relationship is over but how difficult, how difficult that would be. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 3. Moses and, and Jesus were not completely different. Not everything about them. And, and when you're trying to persuade someone, don't we make this mistake sometimes? We immediately begin with what we disagree with. You know? there's, I was just telling, I was telling uh, Kaysen, my coworker, just the other day. There's a teacher, his name was Raymond Kelsey. And Raymond Kelsey had a reputation for being very successful in studying the Bible with people. Did a, did a really great job of bringing people to Christ. And people always want to know, well, what was his technique? What material did he use? And things like, do you know what he did? Do you know why he had uh, some success? He would spend about the first half hour or so of a Bible study, and he would say, what do you believe? How were you raised? What, what were you taught growing up? And he asked, not to manipulate them, but because he wanted to know. 
he felt like that would help him better explain and see where they were. And, and so when they would say, well, you know, I've always believed, and if it was something, he would say, I believe the exact same thing. Isn't that great? The Bible says this, and you're absolutely right. And they would say, well, you know, I, also, I was also raised like this and taught this. And he would say, that's absolutely true. The Bible says this. I agree with you 100%. And then they would say, well, and then I, I believe this. And he would say, well, you know, that's interesting. He said, uh, I'm going to write that down. He said, I, well, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at that. We'll see. We'll see. And then they would go through. And so by the time he got done, he knew where they agreed and where they didn't. And so he would start with, this is where you and I agree. There's no need to rehash this. But by that point, that person thought, I like this guy. There, there was a, a friendship there. there was a, and it, it was just interesting. It had to do with who he was as a person. It wasn't a technique or a, or a material. It was that he cared enough about that person to talk to them and start with agreement. So if you were the writer of Hebrews, and I'm trying to convince you to give up your hero, where should I start? Well, let me tell you all the things that Moses is inferior. No, you would start with, let me tell you how Moses and Jesus are alike. And that's exactly where the writer of Hebrews starts. In Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to look and see how they were alike. Okay, first of all, they were sent by God. Let's look in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. That They were both sent by God. They were both sent for a mission. Um, we know from the Old Testament in Exodus, we'll come back there to Hebrews, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 9, you may remember the story where Moses was sent. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. How is God talking to Moses, by the way? Out of a burning bush. He's speaking to him out of a burning bush. And he says in verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm going to send you. Moses was sent by God. What about Jesus? Did you notice the word in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1? Jesus, the apostle. It's the only time in your New Testament that Jesus is called an apostle. Only time. When we learn the apostles, you know, Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Why isn't Jesus listed as one of the apostles? Because apostle is not a title. It's a description. It's a description. One cent. When you send someone, when you send someone, it's a, the word for an apostle is one cent. Jesus was an apostle because he was sent. He was sent by them. We refer to the apostles, the Jesus' 12 apostles, those that he sent on that particular mission. But the word can be used like this as well of Jesus. He was sent by God. And the Bible tells us in 1 John, tells us the same thing. 1 John uh, chapter 4 and verse 9 says this, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This Moses that you love so much, he was sent, Jesus was sent by the same God. Both guys were sent. They were both faithful to the sender. Is it important that someone is faithful? Does that say something good about a person's character? They're, they're faithful to the sender. Do you remember the story of Naaman when Naaman is cured of leprosy? And his servant, the servant, I guess, of Elijah goes back and claims the reward. The servant goes back to Naaman and collects the changes of clothing and, and things like that. And he gets struck with illness because of it. You think about unfaithful servants, those who don't do what their master has said. When I was a, a brand new second lieutenant, do you know the jobs they give second lieutenants? They're not good jobs. <laughs> They're horrible jobs. Horrible jobs. They, they call the position snacko. It stands for snack officer. And that's, you know, you run the snack bar. I just told myself, he who's faithful and little will be faithful in much. <laughs> yeah, just, just do a good job. But we set up this little snack bar. Someone was stealing from us. Someone was stealing because you'd count the money in the morning and lots of stuff would be gone, but there wouldn't be any money. Well, we had all kinds of stuff, slide cards and surveillance, so it was pretty easy to figure out who did it. It was a security guard. It was a security guard. He was a young security guard, and he was, he was uh, gathering money from all the other security guards, and they would give him their order, and then he would come over to the snack bar, and he would uh, take all the food and stick the money in his pocket. And they never knew... But when we went to his boss and said, look, this is what's happening. This young man is stealing. 
this is the this is the records, this is when the money's missing, this is when when he was in the building, and, and he finally confessed to it. The the anger and the hurt and the frustration of we trusted this young man. We sent him on a mission, we sent him to do something, we trusted him. The reason we sent him is because we thought he was honest and he wasn't. This is important. Being faithful to the sender. Being faithful to the sender. Um, the Bible talks about like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. You know, the, the one who is, who is sent is unfaithful. Um, they were both faithful to their sender. They both did what was right. In verse 2 it says, uh, Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses was faithful. They were both faithful. So you see again, you're, you're building these areas. I agree with you. Well, Moses was sent by God. Yes, he was. And so was Jesus. Well, Moses was faithful. Yes, he was. He was a very faithful servant of God. And so was Jesus. And the third one, these guys are on the same team. See, to the, to the Jews, they saw Moses here and Jesus here. They thought these guys are against each other. And the writer of Hebrews says that they were both sent and they were both faithful in all God's house. These men are from the same household. They're on the same team. You'd put Jesus, Moses, and Jesus, Moses, and not on opposite sides of the team. These guys are together. You've got it wrong. They're not enemies. They're not against each other. They're together. But now you have something of a, of a problem because they're not the same. They're not the same people. And so you need to look and see how they're different. And after the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 3, you start talking about the differences between the two of them. It says in verse 3, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So if you're taking an open book test today, and here's question number 1, and you've got the answers right here in front of you in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 3. Do you, already, do you know the answer to this first one? The Bible says, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. It says, the God's Word says. It's not about personal preferences. It's not about Jews versus Christians. It's about what God's Word has said Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. And then he makes a comparison. He says, well, how much more? You know, this player is better than that player. How much better? How much better are you saying? Now, you're getting into dangerous territory here. Because if you say, I think my player is a little better than your player, but not by much. You know, they're, they're probably pretty close. But the writer of Hebrews says he is so much greater... As much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, and, but the builder of all things is God. So I want you to think about this, this idea of the better builder. Does anybody recognize this house? You do? This, the, this house has a name. Falling water. It's, it's got its own name. It's called falling water. Does anybody know who designed it? See how do you know that? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's one, it's, it's, and it's, it's, if I had a bigger picture of it, it's, it's really amazing the way it's worked in this. It's a great example of a house being worked into nature and it's got all the trees around it. Who gets the honor for this house? Who became famous because of this house? Frank Lloyd Wright. His name. Do you see him in this picture? No, but, but because of the house, the builder gets the glory. The design, the architect gets the glory. And, and here's the image in, in this is that it's not the house that gets the glory. It's the Frank Lloyd Wright, the builder of the house, the creator, the architect of the house. He's the one who gets the house. Have any of you ever been it's way out east but, but to the Biltmore? You've been to the Biltmore? Do, do you know who built it? What family? Uh, uh, the, uh, I do, I understand. Yeah, the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts. When you think about the, this famous family, lots of money. They built it as a some kind of a getaway. <laughs> it's acres and acres and acres of, of stuff. One of the Vanderbilts spent almost his entire inheritance, you know, building it up. But but as they, you know, as they started renting that out and having people come there, and there's a museum there, and now you can go and it's a tourist attraction. Who gets all that money? Where does that go? They go back to the estate. Who who gets that honor? Who? Who receives the, the benefits? Well, not the house. It's not the house. The house isn't a thing. It's the, the builder of the house, the owner of the house. And so you can grasp this idea that it's not Moses. It's not Moses who gets all the glory. 
any more than the house gets the glory. The house itself doesn't get the glory. The builder of the house gets the glory. Every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So you think about who's, who's worthy of more glory. It has to be Jesus and, and much more glory. And then we talk about the son after the glory. Well, what about the sonship? Verse 5, now Moses was faithful in all God's house. That's true. See, there's the agreement. Moses was faithful as a servant. Moses was faithful as a servant, the Bible says, to testify the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ, that Christ is faithful over God's house. See, they're both faithful, but there's a difference. Moses was faithful as a servant, but what about Christ? As a son. But he was faithful as a son. Is there a difference between a servant and a son? As far as honor and glory, I mean, when you, when you talk about which one of them is greater, which one of them is better, if you're going to choose one to put your hope in, well, we're not disciples of him, we're disciples of him. Are you disciples of the servant or are you disciples of the son? You know, are you, are you disciples of, of the lesser or the greater? What does the Bible say about the servant and the, uh, the slave and the son? John chapter 8 and verse 35 says this, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. The slave is just temporary. Do you know that song that we sing sometimes, Pierce My Ear? That, you know, I had someone get really upset one time and said, I don't like that ear piercing song. <laughs> yeah, I know, totally. <laughs> the explanation of what that means, you know, the, the, the song is about the, the slave, you know, whether it was the year of Jubilee and it was time for him to be released. You know, in, in, the, in the Old Testament especially, a slave always had an expectation of being released. There would always come a time when they knew that they could be released. But they would go to the doorpost and they would, you know, have their, which ear, and they, they would have their, the awl punched through their ear and the earring would be put in. And that's why we say, take me to your door this day, for I will serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay. It was a, a mark of the slave saying, I want to be your slave forever. But usually, you'd serve and then you'd be set free. And where would you go? You'd leave. Slaves come and go. Slaves come and go. They're you know, temporary. They're, they're not like children. They're, they're only there for a little while. And he's saying, you know, the, the slave and the son, the son is there forever. The son is permanent. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, the Bible says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. If a man works for you and he messes up at work, he may be very frightened to come and tell you. Some of you have had people who've worked for you before. You know, I, I had a boss that said, uh, uh, you know, problems don't get better with time. You know, t t all kinds of little signs there about, please tell me. Tell me when something goes wrong. But he was a harsh man. He was a harsh man. And, you know, you work for someone. You think, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to come and tell you. But a, but a son... My kids, Dad, I broke, <laughs> I broke this, or I ruined that, or I did that. They know they're not going anywhere. They're going to be my kid. You know, whether your kids break everything in your house. We had a, all those trips to India. I had a little shelf, and I had all these little sentimental items up on the shelf. And Emily wanted to look at them one day when she was a little girl. And she climbed up, and she grabbed on with both hands, and crash. I sent her out of my house. I told her, don't you ever come back. <laughs> You see, the, the, the servant versus the son, the slave versus the son. Look, you get out versus you're my son. The slave versus the son. The Bible is very emphatic. There is no comparison. You are not slaves. You're not slaves to be cast in and out of the church willy-nilly. Sometimes we think that way, don't we? Oh, if God knows what I did, he's going to throw me out of it. No, your sons, your children, we're going to work this out. And, you, and, and yes, I'm angry. And we don't, but isn't that how we treat Yes, I'm angry at what you did. I love you. I'm going to kill you right now, but I love you. Right? Isn't that part of being a parent? I, I, have you ever seen, I've watched, I, mothers especially are, are, are cute when they do this, and they'll go, ah, ah, and, and they will alternate between hugging the life out of a kid, thankful they're alive, and just ripping them one side after another, and just, but that's the tension, isn't it? You are family, and that is the thing here, is that, that, this is a faithful son. He's the son. He's the son of God. When he goes to the father, when he intercedes for us, it is not as a servant or an employee or a slave. He's the son of God. You're comparing a son with a servant and you're choosing the servant. 
I don't know who that guy is. Well, he's the son of the God that you worship. What about Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1? That Galatians is, is about trying to get them to let go of that old law and see the greatness of the, of the new covenant. And he tells them in, in verse, chapter 4 and verse 1, I mean that as the heir, as long as he's a child, he's no different from a slave. See, when the, when the kids are little, they're treated just like the little slave kids. They're led everywhere. They're told what to do. They're bossed around, you know, all that. So the Bible says, although he's the owner of everything. He's not, he's not a slave. He may be treated like a slave, but he's not a slave. He's the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might, what? Receive adoption as sons. Quit acting like slaves. Quit. You, you were under these elementary things when you were little. Do you know in Galatians it compares the old law to what they call a little child leader? You think about someone that could, okay, come on, it's time to go to school. Here we go. This is right. This is wrong. You were good. You were bad. Okay. And then you grow up and all of a sudden you don't want to leave your leader. You don't want to leave your church. No, it's time to grow up. You're a big boy now. You need to put childish things aside. You need to grow up into this new covenant. I don't want to. I, I want to go back. I want to go back to that. I want to be led around everywhere and told what to do and have everything very cut and dry for me. I want to be back under that covenant. But you're not a slave anymore. You're a son. You've got a transition into sonship. You've always owned it. You've always been prepared to inherit. And now it's time for you to do that. It's time for you to grow up. That transition. If you have two men in one household and one is a slave and one is a son, from Scripture, not personal preference, from Scripture, which one is better? The son. Two rounds for Jesus. You know, like your score, <laughs> keeping your scorecard. That's not all. You go back to Hebrews again. The Bible says. Moses was faithful. You have to look for a littler word this time. Moses was faithful. Where? In, in all God's house. Now look at verse 6. But Christ is faithful over. Hmm. Is there a difference between someone being in a house and someone being over a house? Um, I don't know. I, I was trying to think of how to, how to describe this, how to explain this. Have you ever been to a, a restaurant or, a, or a, a business and one of the employees acts like they own the place? <laughs> <laughs> Have you, do you know that? Like, um, excuse me, could you, could you grab that for me? Well, uh, no, I don't, I don't think that uh, we're going to be selling that to you today. It's like, where's your manager? You know? so, sometimes you start to identify with something and you think that you're over something when really you're just in something. And, and I know that feeling. I mean, you start to feel, you know, as a preacher's kid, it's funny. You start to think that, I mean, it's, you know, the church is where your family lives or, you know, it's, and you see someone messing something up. But it's not your place. You're, you're, you're in the building. You're not over the building. My son walked out one day and he said, Dad, do you own this place? <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Not at all. Not at all. Is there a difference between being in God's house and over God's house? I saw, I, I wish I could find it. I've looked everywhere for it. I think it was in Reader's Digest years ago. But a security guard, he had, he had trained, he was eager. He, it's all, from that all in a day's work or something like that where they write the stories. And, and he said he came in to, uh, to be a security guard at this very large house. And he was so eager. He was ready to go. And he said, uh, all of a sudden he saw this man coming in the back door. And he's like, oh, what? stop, you can't. He said, do you work here? And the man said, no, I don't. And he said, well, then you can't come back in here. The, and he said about that time he saw a picture <laughs> sitting off to the side and this guy was in it. And he said, do you live here? <laughs> and he said, yes, I do. <laughs> and he said, I'm so sorry. And he said, no, thank you, for <laughs> thank you for watching out for my house. There is a difference between working in a house and being over a house. We understand that. The one over the house is the, the owner, the ruler, the, the head of those Things. There's a difference in authority, a difference in honor. Moses served in God's house. Moses would be the person who says, I'm sorry, I just work here. Let me go get the boss. Jesus serves over God's house. If you were in God's house and said, who's in charge here? Jesus would say, I am. I'm over this house. There's a difference in authority. 
who gets the nod? It's Jesus. The writer of Hebrews, he lays this out. Yes, yes, he's faithful, but you know, Jesus has more glory, a lot more glory. One is a son and one is a, a slave. One is over the house and one is in the house. And, and these things are from Scripture. These things are things that they would have understood about, about the Messiah to come and, and all of these different things. But, but why does it matter to us? You know, we, we're not the ones advocating for Moses to be our, our leader. What, what does it matter to us? Look at the end in chapter 3 when it's making this comparison at the end of verse 6. Because it says, Moses is faithful in God's house. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. We are his house. That's very, a very different statement from this is his house. Right? Is this his house or are we his house? The Bible says we're his house. Sometimes we get confused in our songs we teach our kids. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. It's very funny because the Bible says God doesn't dwell in houses made with human hands, right? But he doesn't dwell here. You know, they, they said this is really, you can see this in a little girl. They were driving away one Sunday afternoon and she said, bye God, I'll see you next week. <laughs> you know, in, the, in some of the little books, the little girl, it's called letters to, children's letters to God or something like that. And one of her letters, she said, God, I got some new shoes this week. If you'll watch on Sunday, I'll show them to you. You know, but, but and cute and all, but... It, should we be teaching that God dwells in this building? When the Bible says we're his house, we're his household, we're, he dwells within us and, and, and we carry him where we go. And, and Paul wrote to Timothy and told him in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 that, that we might know how to conduct ourselves in the household of God. Now, does that, ma does that mean anything to us if, if we are in his house? How many of you grew up with this phrase or heard this phrase? As long as you're under my roof... Yeah, what does that mean? Did, have you ever used that phrase? No. no, it's kind of an old, you know. As long as you're under my roof, what does that mean? If you're going to live here, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in my house, then what? You're going to follow my rules. Is that fair? I mean, in my house, you're going to follow my rules. It was very interesting when when I uh, first started preaching. Um. Well, I'll, I'll ask this question in just a moment. If it means that we're under his rule, there's a blessing because it also means we're under his protection. You know, hospitality in the West is not the same as hospitality in the East. In Eastern hospitality, when you invited someone into your home, they were under your protection. And if that meant, you know, it's funny. If, if someone came into our home and, and someone came up and knocked and said, hey, have you seen a guy run, walking around here? Oh, yeah, there he is. Here you go. But in the East, in Eastern culture, if you bring someone across your threshold and they're in your house your own life would be forfeit before you would give them up. That's that, the strength of that hospitality, you know, that protectiveness. That's why it's interesting, a little side sermon here, when the Bible talks about an elder has to be hospitable, it doesn't just mean he likes to have people over for dinner. There's a protective quality to that word when it talks about hospitality. It's a much deeper word than we give it in our Western culture. But, but the idea about uh, we are in his house, we're under his rule, we're under his protection. If it's God's house and we're part of it, does he have the right to set the conditions for entry into his house? Do you know one of the first preaching jobs I had that we lived in a preacher's house, which is an adventure of its, uh, in itself. But they had a tradition in this congregation where when new members came, they, they, they all had keys to our house because it was the church's house. And we would very often come home. We'd, we'd be out in town somewhere. We'd come home, and there would be members of the church sitting on the couch watching TV in the living room or something like that. Or they, yeah, yeah. See, my wife is up here person. <laughs> but it's very distressing when you come home and you're like, hey, there's people in the house. And as, and as uncomfortable as that made us, do you know, we didn't own that house. The church owned that house. And if we didn't like it, we could go buy our own house and not pass out keys. And I'm telling you, that, seems kind of, that may seem kind of strange to you, but there is this idea, if you own it, it's yours. And, and it, to me, it, the offense to God to say, look, God, I know it's your house and I know I'm, I'm part of your house, but I'm going to decide who gets in and who doesn't. I'm going to decide who gets keys and who... No, God says, this is my house. And, and you can, you'll be part of this house if, and then there's that conditional, that conditional of being in the house of God, if we hold fast our confidence, 
um, or hold firmly, your Bible might say. It's interesting. This word for confidence means a cheerful courage, a boldness, an assurance, something professed openly or plainly or publicly. It's an outward manifestation of an inner faith. Again, it's what we teach our little kids. This little light of mine. I'm going to do what? I'm going to let it shine. That's what that word means. My confidence. That word has that idea. This is my confidence. We tend to think of confidence like this. It me, it's this. My openness, my boldness, my, my ownership of Jesus. If we, can, if we hold him, what verse does it make you think of? If we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father. That's consistent with this. If we hold fast to our confidence, and what do we teach the children? Hide it under a bushel? No, no. no. No, why not? Because the Bible says, if you want to be part of his house, if we hold our confidence. Yes, I'm Christ. Yes, I'm part of his. I'm not a disciple of Moses. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I own him. He's mine. He's my master. I wear his name. That's what that first word means. Our confidence, our boasting in our hope. Now, I want you, we're, we're about out of time. I want you to look in John chapter 5 and verse 45. They are not believing Jesus at all. They are not putting their faith in him. Look at, listen to what Jesus says to them in John chapter 5 and verse 42. I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think I'll accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moses, their hero. There is one who accuses you. Moses, now what does the end of your verse say? On whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Team Moses, we're Team Moses, we're putting our hope in Moses. And isn't that tragic that Jesus says... You're going to have an accuser. It's going to be Moses. And he's going to say, gentlemen, I was talking about him. I told you about him. I prophesied about him. I wrote about him. Everything was about him. And Jesus says, you don't receive me. You don't believe him because he told you about me. They put their hope in him. Now, I want you to think about poor Peter on the transfiguration. P Peter just shoves that foot right in his mouth. And what does he say? Uh, Lord, I'll build three tents or tabernacles or, or altars. Uh, one for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. The Bible says while the words are still in his mouth, the voice of God. <laughs> hey, I haven't... I... This is my beloved son. Listen to him. God says, this, this is my... Not Elijah, not Moses. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Peter's the one who says there's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. Not Moses, not Elijah, just Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. He writes to the church and he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope... What does your Bible say? Completely, not partially, not somewhat, not 80% or 90%. Completely or fully on the grace that would be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You set your hope fully on the grace of Christ, not on Moses. Jesus says you've set your faith on Moses and he's going to burn you for it. He's going to accuse you for it. You've put your faith in man. You've put your faith in someone other than Christ. They searched the scriptures thinking that in them they would find life. They were told you've been severed from Christ. You've fallen from grace. Those were seeking to be justified by the law. I'm going to look at one last scripture in the book of John. John chapter 1. Moses and Jesus both brought us something. The Bible says they both brought something in, in John chapter 1. Look in verse 16 and 17. Speaking of Jesus, it says, And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
Where have you set your hope? On the law? Those who set their hope on the law, the Bible says you've fallen from grace. You've been severed from Christ. You're not going to find salvation in the law. The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Their response was, we are disciples of Moses. So the only place you're going to be able to find your salvation is here. And you're not going to find it. It's not going to be there. But what about us? What about us? Where have you set your hope? We say, not on Moses. I, I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't put all my, I'm not a disciple of Moses. I haven't put my trust in Moses. Let me ask you this. Is it any better for you to put your hope in someone else than Christ in the same way they put their hope in Moses? Could you say, oh, Jews, you fools, why would you put your hope in Moses? I put my hope in my grandfather. I put my hope in my preacher. My preacher said, my elder said, is that smarter, wiser than putting your hope in Moses? What about Muhammad? Well, but the prophet said, Muhammad has said, he said this. You're going to put your hope in Muhammad more than Moses? What about Mary? Well, I'm going to pray to Mary. I'm going to ask Mary for you. I'm going to put my hope in Mary that she'll intercede for me. Is that smarter? What about a priest? Well, I'm going to put my hope in my priest. I'm going to ask my priest to pray for forgiveness for me. I'm going to have my priest do that for me. I'm going to put my hope in a, a latter-day prophet or someone else or the pope. Or I'm going to ask the pope or in my parents, my mom and dad, or, or someone else. I'm going to have someone else. The Bible says Jesus is the son over his father's house, and he brought grace and truth to save our souls. And I want to tell you, there is no one, no matter how much you love them or admire them or respect them, no matter how well-educated they are or how outwardly righteous they may appear to you, Nobody deserves your allegiance. Nobody has earned your allegiance other than Jesus Christ. Winner by a knockout. Jesus Christ is better than Moses. The prayer was, Paul wrote that his prayer was that his people would come to a knowledge of the truth and that they would understand it is no contest. Jesus is better than Moses. Thank you for 